Hi, hello, and welcome to Telugu Radio Facebook Live on USA Immigration. So today is a very interesting subject and a topic. Uh, our attorney bring a lot, lot of, lot of news, big news to all H1 holders and uh, L1 holders. So we can discuss today on this one, and uh, I think just uh, we got a one information about the. I scale 1044, the bill S386 bill got passed in uh, the senator, but uh, not confirmed yet. But we will discuss this new bill too in, with uh, our attorney. So, so let's uh, welcome to the our attorney Lucas from Burgos and Garrison Law Firm from Dallas. Uh, welcome, Lucas. Welcome today, Wednesday uh, show, live show. The welcome to Telugu and Radio web live Thank web you. page. Thank you, Venkat. It's good to be back. Hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, a lot of things have been happening over the past two weeks, so hopefully we can get everyone informed today with today's show. Yes. So I think um, last week we did not do the show, but um, this week we brought the good news. Let's say, even we want to hear from you, please share the good news to our list of viewers. Well, uh, as we discussed over the past few weeks, uh, you know, this new rule that was going both for Department of Labor and for Department of Homeland Security uh, was found to be um, uh, a violation of the uh, APA. And uh, therefore, a judge in the Northern District of California has uh, suspended or revoked the rules uh, that USCIS implemented. And what this means is we've already felt the effects of the wage increase for all four wage levels, uh, depending on where you're working. Um, and the proposed uh, new rules for limited duration, employer-employee relationship, third-party offsite employment, uh, which is supposed to take effect uh, next Monday, the 7th of December, uh, both of those rules are now suspended. Uh, and like we discussed on the show, we didn't think that they would be uh, approved or be found to be uh, uh, in line with the rulemaking process because there was no uh, notice and comment period made for either of the proposals. And, and what this means is anytime we have a rulemaking procedure or some change to our regulations, we we have to have a, a period of time to where we can have an uh, option for the public to comment on what these changes might be, how they might affect uh, business or individuals. And then, um, you know, the agency has to review these uh, the comments. And to bypass that, there's certain circumstances where the government can do this. And what the administration tried to do was to, you know, rely on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic to try and push these rules through any type of uh, notice or comment uh, period. So uh, very happy. We're, you know, hopefully uh, by this time tomorrow, the uh, DOL flag website will reflect the changes so uh, everyone can get back to filing LCAs, uh, extensions, amendments, change of employers, and so forth. Yeah, Lucas, this is a really good news for everyone who are waiting for the extension and amendment. Even so, we discussed a uh, couple of couple of topic and uh, uh, of H one holders uh, eagerly. Even so, they eagerly waiting for this changes. So even so, court uh, court uh, court um, decision, so they can apply the amendment and uh, extension. So, Lucas, we are talking about the interim uh, final rule. Um, it it belongs only to the prevailing wages, or it all included whatever the new changes regulation reg, reg, uh, regulation happened on October eighth, October sixth. Uh, all those are revert back to previous wages, or uh, whatever the previous changes. Correct. So each year, um, the wage levels are are set based upon surveys and and. Um, research done by Bureau of Labor Statistics to determine what the appropriate wage levels are for the MSAs or Metropolitan Statistical Areas uh, for whatever job category SOC code. 
that might be as long as the the area where the work would be located. So that's conducted every uh, July 1st. You know, it's when it's published uh, each year. So the fiscal year would be, you know, July 1st to uh, June 30th of the following year. Um, And, you know, now everything is going to revert back to what happened post uh, July 1st this year. So it, it might take a day or two for the systems to, you know, fully integrate and go back to the database the way it was set up with the other wage levels. But it should be a pretty straightforward process because it only took them, uh, you know, a day or two to, to upload all the changes. It should be a day or two to change back. Okay. Lucas, I have a question about the specialty occupation. So recently, October 6th, uh, USCIS defined the specialty occupation. Uh, can you give the more information on that? Uh, this court is also ruled out those specialty occupation or still the USC is considering the whatever the uh, st- pursued the degree they want to do the, the same segment of uh, uh, career? Well, yeah, that's another good question. So the IFR, the interim final rule, uh, basically would cover two agencies, Department of Labor, which we just discussed about the wage level increase, and Department of Homeland Security, which would uh, encompass uh, underneath that umbrella USCIS. So both of the rules, or both parts of the rule, were found to uh, not be uh, fo- you know, legal, so to speak, underneath the uh, APA. Um, and therefore, both even though the, the USCIS part of the rule or Department of Homeland Security rule has not taken effect yet, it was set to take effect on the 7th. But now both of the rules are going to be uh, suspended uh, and not uh, you know, eligible to move forward. Now, the government does, has, uh, does have an option to file an appeal. Now, what would this mean? Well, if the government does file an appeal, it would have to show that, you know, the underlying district court didn't um, have the proper authority to, to issue the injunction based upon the merits of, of the facts of the case that were presented. Now, it, to do this, um, you know, one would have a difficult time, uh, in, depending on which circuit court you start with and which... Um, uh, appellate court you would be assigned to. So in California, where this lawsuit was decided, which is in San Francisco, it goes to the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit uh, is probably one of the more liberal uh, courts within the United States. So um, the chances of an appellate court rescinding the injunction and, and re- remanding it back to the district court to move further without the injunction would pretty much be a very small percentage at this point of, of that happening. So it looks like the timing of, A, the, the pr- procedure and process to get this done, along with the end of the presidential administration, which, you know, we're just about one month or a month and a few days uh, until, you know, we have a new president, you know, uh, it looks like it's very favorable to us for this rule to not ever really be uh, uh a, you know, um, legally uh, filed or, or put into the regulations to, to be enforceable. Uh, because when the new president comes in, he could just simply say, I don't, I no longer wish to appeal this issue. And uh, they could drop the case at that point in time. Okay. <clears throat> the Lucas, uh, in IFR, in October 6th, the U.S. has released the three, uh, three rules. The one of the rule is uh, another rule is the short term approvals. If any 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 H one holder working in third party place uh, third 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 party companies, maybe we here only will get the only one year one year one year of approval. So hopefully, this is also ruled out. Uh, everyone get the three years extension H one right. This is correct or? Yes. So that's basically what we just said. Um... There's for the DHS rule. There were three main parts to it. You have the um, uh, employer-employee relationship, uh, which they were trying to uh, reestablish as part of a requirement in the regulations for H-1B visas. 
You also have the one year um, limit on the validity period. So up to one year being authorized instead of the three uh, that was issued by statute. Uh, and then also the what we call the third party offsite employment where we want to show all the contracts, work product, uh, client letters, vendor letters, and all that was also tried to be included in this. So there were three parts to the DHS rule. And now, since the judge has uh, thrown that out and suspended the implementation of this rule, we don't have to worry about that at the moment. I think uh, I think you're on uh, mute, Venkat. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm on mute. <laughs> so, uh, Lucas, just uh, I saw the couple of websites is saying that. Um, the I scale 1044, the bill is S386 got approved in the Senate. Um, do you have any information from your attorney groups or this bill got approved? I, actually, I haven't heard anything. Uh, you know, for our attorney groups, uh, specifically you're referencing AILA, American Immigration Lawyers Association. We haven't heard anything through our... Uh, um, newsletters or anything like that or message boards today. Now, I went ahead uh, today prior to the show just to check uh, Representative Mike Lee from Utah thinks is sponsoring senator for this uh, bill, and we didn't see any press release or any notification from that. I also checked the official page for the Congress, uh, and it shows it's still pending in the Senate. So, it, you know, there's probably a chance it could have passed, but... As far as the formalities of proper notification and announcement, I, I don't see anything at this time. Doesn't mean it might, hasn't happened yet, but I haven't seen any uh, news to reflect that uh, we can confirm that. Okay. I think this bill uh, got hold by the Democrat uh, Senate or Rep Republic Senate currently? So the Republicans have controlled the Senate, and we have Mitch McConnell, who's the Senate Majority Leader, and... Um, he, we're entering a term right now, post-election, but prior to the uh, start of the, the new Congress, this is what we call a lame duck, uh, which means there's not much authority for Congress to act. Now, the other day, uh, due to this, the extensive need for a stimulus package due to the COVID-19, I think there was another, you know, the uh, second part of the CARES Act was passed into law but um as of this moment i haven't heard of anything else really moving and, and most likely nothing will really happen until uh, you know the new administration comes in new new senators come in uh, and new congress is is established so uh at this point in time it would be kind of um, uh a unique situation to say this to say the least if something like that did happen so um, I would lean more towards caution before believing that this passed. Now, remember, even if the Senate approves and uh, uh, forwards the bill, unless they have you know a certain majority, a supermajority on that, the president can still veto the the law. So we'll okay. we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, I think uh, this will maybe will expire by December twenty twenty. So do you? I think yes or no. Yeah, I mean, it only, there's a shelf life on on these uh, bills when they're put through the process, okay, uh, and when they're introduced. And if you know they're not um, passed through committee or they're not uh, various other administrative or procedural issues or processes don't take place, then they'll time out or you know or lapse. Uh, so. You know, it's not to say that it's the end of the line if if we get past the December 20th date uh, that it can't be reintroduced or removed. But like we were saying for many weeks, uh, especially going back a, a month ago or two months ago with the uh, visa bulletins, I really believe, you know, the focus should be on uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And I, I actually think that we're going to receive uh, uh the better hope of something happening through new legislation rather than what's already pending. Uh, and what this means is, you know, the Congress has the opportunity to where they can address many other issues, uh, 
uh, many other problems within the system and, and make sure it's a well thought out uh, process for, for all facets of immigration uh, cases rather than just the backlog we have here. So, you know, I think in all fairness, the best thing to move forward, the best hope of anything happening is going to be through uh, comprehensive immigration reform with the new administration, the new Congress, uh, hopefully coming up here uh, in, a, in a month or two. Okay. Lucas, before uh, going to the next question, I'm requesting to the all viewers, if you have any questions, maybe you can post uh, in a uh, Facebook page. So it get an opportunity to ask you a question and get more information from the attorney, Lucas. Uh, Lucas, uh, just uh, we can step into the December visa bulletin. So we saw the little bit changes. His final action date is moved a couple of days, and uh, and filing date got EB three got uh, retrogressed to the January first, two thousand fourteen. So is there any additional information apart from this uh, visa bulletin? No, there. There's nothing really new other than the retrogression of the date. Now, I would like to take a moment and just, you know, remind people that due to the amount of cases that were probably filed, uh, we're still pending receipts. I, I've received uh, case receipts for people who filed uh, that required a supplement J. Now, I've heard from other attorneys and, you know, uh, within our own uh, message boards with AILA that, uh, anyone who downgraded or filed an I-140 along with the adjustment, you know, there's been uh, quite a few delays with USCIS uh, on generating receipts for those cases. So hopefully the next week or two, we'll start seeing those uh, cases progress and come through. But uh, as of right now, there's nothing really new with the visa bulletin. Um, and, you know, everything's just real slow processing as far as the receipts go. Okay. I think whoever applied in before uh, October 20th, they got the receipt number and uh, fingerprints dates. But after 20 October 20, still they did not get the receipt number. When they can expect the receipt number next uh, couple, of, just, couple of weeks? It just, it just depends. So like I said, there's a few factors involved here. If you filed an adjustment status and you were, you know, let's say you're EB2, and you're with the same employer and you file just a supplement J. Well, there's two ways. There's two service centers that you would file to our lock boxes. Uh, each one might process faster or slower. Uh, anyone who filed an I-140 downgrading um, with this process, they only go to one service center. So it goes to the Texas service center. So if you can imagine in that one group, you know, maybe of 20,000 possible people filing adjustment at once, I would estimate that at least 80% is going to be downgrade cases included. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, the workers at the at that facility processing everything. And, um, you know, hopefully here this week, next week, we'll start seeing some receipts. Okay. Hopefully everyone will get the receipt number as soon as possible because some of uh, some of H1 holders, they want to expedite the process. Maybe whoever downgrade EB2 to EB3, they want to uh, proceed the faster, maybe expedite process. That's why if some of are waiting for the receipt number. Uh, Lucas, uh, we can go for the next uh, segment, H4 EAD. So can you give the about the H4 EAD, it means we saw a lot of issues from the past six months. The entire H4 EAD, H4 and H4 EAD process got delayed. Even whoever applied the H4, still they did not get the maybe they got the receipt number, but they did not get the uh, biometric biometric. So due to the biometric process, uh, their petition is not going to the next step. It uh, hanging the biometric stage. So this is affecting the lot of um, the lot of the employees who are working right now. It is impacting it, it is impacting. So because the employer is not holding their employment, 
so can you give me the what is the reason to delay and is there any way to expedite the process to get the h4 ead so you know what you're referencing is an issue that we've encountered you know probably for a year and a half now and it's progressively become more and more of a backlog in part you know due to the pandemic you know um a lot of the in-person appointments were canceled for you know two or three months with uscis so to give you you know a little bit of a background what we used to do is if uh, let's say if i was filing an extension for myself and i wanted to file also h4 h4 ead for my spouse uh and i filed my case in premium prior to the biometrics uh requirement you know we could pretty much anticipate my case would be you know approved within two weeks and pretty much within a you know uh the same week or the week after the h4 ead would arrive uh when uscis implemented the biometrics uh, process you have to remember uh you know we get the receipts everything's generated and then uh depending on where you live uscis will assign you to go to a local you know facility to do the biometrics so here in dallas you know there won't, might be one or two locations where you go if you live in fort worth there's a different location you would go to if you live in atlanta etc cetera, etc cetera. so depending on how many other people who live in that area would use the service it depends on how fast you might have an appointment now what compounds this is when we had um i believe this march USCIS, you know, closed all of the appointments and interviews for biometrics. And uh, what this has done is caused a tremendous backlog. So, you know, in a system that traditionally is a first in, first out process, uh, it hasn't been that way. So I've seen people, uh, some we file like maybe in June or July, they'll be, you know, able to get their biometrics appointment prior to someone who filed in April. So it's been a, a, an odd process and, and it's been uh, a huge delay to say the least. Now, going to phase part two of your question on the, the part of uh, expediting, uh, you know, due to hardship, uh, you know, the, the filing of, and the approval of the, the H4 EAD, you know, you, you can show the process is um, one where you would have to call in and make a service request. The service request would come back in the form of an email in the email, you can supplement evidence and things like this and address why it's important for you to uh, get the uh, expedited request. Now, here the past uh, month and here again recently, um, U USCIS has changed their phone system where it's very difficult to even get to a live person to discuss anything, a level one officer. Uh, so because of that, um, it's hard to get it in to the queue to have this request made so you can have this, you know, uh, you know, expedited. So it, it's been a, very much a headache and it's every day it's a, a changing process. So um, if anything, the process has become more difficult rather than easier. And so hopefully what we can see is someone addressing this in the near future for maybe the, we can use existing biometric information to just rerun the data and see, you know, running this in databases to see if there's any changes. Maybe that will help speed up the process or maybe eventually we'll get caught up and pass the backlog. So the times, you know, go back to more of a normal processing time. Okay. Lucas, here I have a, a couple of questions on H4 EAD. Even so, I got a couple of inquiries about the expedite um, H4 EAD by using the litigation. The, yes. What is the litigation in immigration system? Well, the litigation is, is a few, you have a few different types of recourse. Primarily what we're talking about here would be a, a mandamus action where we're going to ask the court to make USCIS, the agency, perform um, a function that they should perform in a timely manner or without delay. Uh, the problem is most of the time for the H4 EAD, the, you know, unless you're pretty much, unless the H4 is already approved, um, it's hard to do a mandamus action unless it's outside normal processing times, unless, 
your H4, you know, you receive notice that it's, it's approved, but you haven't received the card. That would be one way of, of showing, uh, you know, a lawsuit, uh, USCIS. Now, when we're doing these actions, you know, we have to show that there's um, undue, de- you know, the undue delay and things like this on the part of the government. And, you know, it's possible to do this, but, you know, you can't really, it's more difficult to move forward with a case if you're only waiting six weeks rather than half a year, so on and so forth. So every case is somewhat unique in the sense we have to look at the surrounding uh, factors, the evidence that surrounds each case to determine what's uh, going to be a successful case and what's potentially not a successful case at that moment to pursue litigation. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say if any any uh, H4 holder want to expertise by using the litigation, when can uh, when can they can uh, start the process? Let's say uh, one of H1 hold H4 holder applied three weeks ago. They uh-huh. got they they got the receipt number, but they did not got the fingerprints. So if they want to expedite by using the litigation, will it work? Probably not. And just to clarify, so a lot of people this last year might have used a process where there was litigation for an expedited process. Uh, that was a group of uh, people who filed the lawsuit. And the lawsuit was to focus on, you know, long delays and things like this. So if you were a member of that group and you could join later, then it was possible to maybe get this moving f- faster because you were a part of a large group. So if there was a situation like that again, where you had a large number of people pursuing litigation with a, a, a certain issue that was ripe at the time or, uh, you know, uh, focused on a new issue that might've come up, then yeah, you, you that would be possible. But going one by one, it's very unique uh, and specific for each individual. And you would really need to show in a mandamus action, and that is in that sense that uh, there that there was undue delay, that maybe the case was approved, uh, but you haven't received the card, that there were delays like that. So, like I said, it's very specific to each individual's case, and if there is a group uh, litigation effort like there was last year, you know that's something that if whoever the attorney is handling that litigation will be able to say, you know, yeah, we want to include you or he's, these are the factors or, or background of your case that you would have to have to match what we're doing here. So. Okay. So the express process only the litigation or is any other things? Well, at this moment, you know, what we would want to do is hopefully have the new administration, like we've discussed with comprehensive immigration reform, where there's there's over 30 categories for employment authorization. Okay, one of which is H-4 EAD. Now, since we're another is uh, if you're filing for adjustment of status. So we have one category for adjustment status, which is C-09, and we have H-4 EAD, which is C-26. Okay. For CO9, uh, once your employment authorization expires, you can continue working uh, on the receipt for six months, pending your new EAD card. For H4 EAD, where this becomes difficult, is you cannot work on the receipt. You have to have actual renewed card in your hand to continue your employment after your other card expires. So maybe there's uh, something that can be addressed where everyone who has employment authorization can work on the receipt uh, for six months pending the new card or some some change to that effect, okay? Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the, at the really the, the best news we've had, along with some of these recent court cases, uh, is that it seems that H4 EAD is going to be safe. It's not going to have much more of any threats of being uh, revoked or tried to be taken away, so... Uh, even though it's a bit of a headache and, it, and it's precarious at times as far as going through this process, uh, at least that um, option is there for people who want to choose to to file H four EAD. Yeah, here uh, just uh, one information: C zero nine is a uh, is EAD is belongs at, from the adjustment of status as a green card process. The C twenty six is H four EAD. So correct. The C O nine 
they can work on receipt number, but uh, H4 EAD cannot work on the receipt number. Correct. Yeah. It means, uh, um, yeah, Lucas, I saw the one scenario. Uh, is not a H1B, is L2 EAD. They applied in uh, before pandemic, uh, before closing the service center in advance of before April. So they applied the petition, but some reason uh, it got RFE on primary application. So as of now, they did not get the biometric. So after, after it means other other one applied after mm, pandemic, maybe May or June. They got the biometric and they got the EAD, but who, whoever applied in uh, March, they stuck in the process. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, the petition is not resolving steps. So do you have any information what uh, kind of necessary action it meant? Take action on this one. Any steps are new? Any well, steps? We, I mean, you can always go to uscis.gov, and we can file uh, an e-request, which the case would be outside of normal processing times. Uh, we can also call the customer service number, which we discussed a minute ago. Um, you know, and you'd want to try and get a hold of a level one officer to see about you know what the problem is about to resolving the delay in processing. Um, and then if you were able to get through to level one, then if they re reply back with an option where you could upload documents or things like this for further information, then you would want to do that to try and expedite the process. But um, it's very much disorganized. Um, I, I don't know if there's really much of a procedure in place for USCIS officers to go back and, and you know, maybe fix these issues because you have to remember uh, Venkat, you're in Houston. I'm in Dallas. It's two completely different offices used for biometrics. And, you know, it, if the appointments aren't available within that time, then you're asking the officers to, on their own accord, to go back and make sure it's scheduled. And, you know, with, with such delays and backlogs, I can see where, you know, we might have some officers who are pretty proficient or there's maybe less of a backlog if you're in maybe in um, Nebraska you know, versus, you know, here in Texas where we have a higher density of uh, an immigrant population that, re that needs these uh, services. So based on all of that, there's a lot of factors that they can cause certain locations and certain groups to be delayed more so than uh, other places in the country. Yeah, okay. Uh, Lucas, we got a one question from Narendra. <clears throat> How long it will take to receive the EAD card after fingerprints completed. Is there any timeline or? For um, H4 EAD? Yes. Um, you know, typically, I would say right now, if we filed one in June, what is that, about four months total? Four and a half months um, after months after, after filing. fingerprints. After uh, filing. Yeah, after filing. And that was in June. So that's what we've been averaging here lately. But the ones we filed in March, there's still some that are just pending and, and kind of in limbo. So if you have a case that's filed more recent uh, for EAD, it seems like it's about four, four and a half months. Um, you know, but that's just a, a guesstimate at best. You know, it's just kind of the trend we see. Uh, but we still have, you know, and I, I've spent a lot of time trying to get a hold of officers to try and fix this for a number of people who we filed the cases for in uh, February, March, and April. It's just, it's just a, a, a side effect of everything else that's gone on with this uh, pandemic. Yeah. I think the H4E, H4 EAD process, the whole the biometric is holding the process, enter the process. Hopefully the next uh, administration, uh, presidential administration, remove the fingerprints, maybe everything will be small. Well, I actually received a few notices here for cases we filed in March where they waived the need to go for biometrics, that they have the biometrics from previous uh, case still on file, and they were able to use that data. So, um, 
you know, some cases, uh, I think that they're trying to even implement that to speed up the process. Yeah, I think this uh, H4 EAD bio, it, it, H4 the biometric got in 2019, right? So whoever uh, H1 got approved in 2018, they still, they don't have the biometric in the United States. So for, if they applied now, maybe they, if they extension or they apply the H4 EAD, they have to have go for the biometric. It's true, or maybe they given in a consulate uh, the while pursuing the visa, is this okay to get the biometric from their consulate? Uh, typically, you're talking about two different distinct agencies. So whatever you would do when you fill out your DS-160 and go for appointment interview would be within Department of State. Uh, and when you come back here to the United States, so let's say you went and you're abroad, you come back and you have your... Uh, H4 stamp and you enter the United States with your I-94 and you have a duration of one more year, well, at that time you can, when you come back here, then you would apply with USCIS for your EAD. Now, when you do that, you're probably going to be required to go ahead and do biometrics uh, because of the USCIS uh, guidelines and procedures. Okay. So, Lucas, uh, we got it question from Teja. He, he got I-140 approved in EB2. Now he with different company. The current company is saying that they will apply in EB3. Is that okay? Will there be any impact on time of well, EB3 GC process it downgraded? Teja, I'm glad you asked the question. And yes, the, you know, there's there's been some changes here within the past couple of weeks. That, that will impact this. Um, USCIS has implemented a new policy that uh, makes it a little bit more difficult to port your job from one employer to another and preserve your uh, uh, priority date from one I-140 to another. So what you would want to have to do is, is really have the attorney examine and know uh, the specific job requirements and how they match and can it, it can be related to be something similar. Um, so the adjudicator field manual, the adjudicator's field manual, um, the AFM that the, the USCIS would rely upon when deciding whether or not to port over the new date, uh, it's going to be more specific than maybe a, a two months ago. So what this means is whenever you know, you might have to have a strategy of filing the uh, labor itself is where it's a could be an EB2. Uh, and then whenever you file I-140, you would just choose, you know, a downgrade um, option to to get the EB3 category. So there's a lot of different uh, factors involved with this, but uh, it is possible. But unfortunately, now there's a little bit more of a scrutiny involved when the uh, the service is looking to port over the priority date. Okay. It means so if any I-140 holder might be H-1 holder, and previously they applied LCA and EB-2 and applied in I-140 and EB-2, if they change to the another company, they cannot apply in EB-3, right? Uh, no. So the labor itself, the 9089, uh, is not specific to EB2 or EB3. What we have to do as attorneys is we have to determine when we file, does the labor uh, that we file, the ETA, does it meet the requirements for USCIS to, de to determine whether or not the position is, qualifies for EB2 or EB3? So what this means uh, for EB2, uh, you would be looking at a master's degree or a bachelor's degree with five years of experience. Um, so if you do a uh, labor and the ETA where you say the minimum degree requirement would be an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree with two years of experience, that's not going to qualify for EB2 when you file the I-140. It doesn't mean that the labor itself is not valid. It doesn't mean anything else. It just means it won't meet that requirement when you file with USCIS. So vice, vice versa, what you would want to do if you're filing EB3 with USCIS, 
you would want the labor to still meet the requirements of what the position would be so the position could qualify for EB2, you know, or you could choose to file an EB3, but you would want to have that bar set high. And then if you don't use the EB2 filing, you could still do EB3 or in the future, if you want to upgrade, then you could upgrade to EB2 from EB3. Um, you know, if the final action dates move quickly or something else happens. Okay. So, Lucas, we are discussing about uh, I-140. Uh, I have a couple of questions on I-140. Mm -hmm. So, if first we apply the perm, right? The ones approve the perm, we will apply I-140. Let's say if any H-1 holder at reaching to the six years term, so maybe they have only the couple of weeks uh, at the time he had he had approved perm. Will he apply the H one extension with the perm? So, as long as the perm is not expired, and what this means is that either it's a valid perm, which they're valid for six months, so the ETA nine zero eight nine, or if uh, it was filed before, but like the I one forty was denied for any reason, that's valid to go ahead and extend beyond the six years. You don't have to have an approved I-140. So under AC-21, um, you have, as long as you have a certified labor, that's the most important thing. Now, some people might, it, the reason we get, you know, to the six year and people need to have that process started, the reason is there's also an exception. Let's say your labor is an audit and it's pending or something happened to him was denied but the whole labor has been pending for more than one year you can use that and forward that uh, whenever it's time to extend beyond the six year so there's certain other factors and circumstances you, that might merit uh, you qualifying to go beyond six years even if you don't have an i-140 uh, in your hand okay the same question on the you no know, H h1 extension based on the perm approval. Let's say if H1 holder is a I-94 expiring December 3rd. So they want to apply the H1 extension today. Maybe they they have the FedEx tracking number. So maybe uh, the FedEx tracking, FedEx will reach by tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? It, we sent today, it means uh, overnight, it will ship tomorrow. So by the time the USCS receives the receipt, so, but it will not generate the receipt number, H H1 extension receipt number. Correct. The still valid for I-94, will he stay Correct. in United States? Correct. So as long so USCIS uh, factors in the day you mail the, the petition itself. So uh, this works for transfers, extensions, all the same. So let's say that... Uh, you know, I'm going to file uh, a change of employer and your start date is today or an amendment or something like this. As long as I file the petition on the same day as when you start, that's acceptable. OK, also for the expiration of the I-94. Now, it's not good to wait till the last day, but you can file the day of uh, expiration if, if it came to the <laughs> that close uh, and it would be accepted by USCIS. Now, when you have a, a, a certified labor or ETA 9089 form, you're going to be able to extend one more year rather than the three that if you would have had the I-140 approved. But at least it, it allows you to go beyond the six years and it protects you that way. Okay. So we got another question from the Teja. Uh, maybe Teja had um, H1 for the next Let's. I'm taking the example. Uh, Teja had a H1 extension by 2022. After one year, he moved to the another company. Mm. His wife got H4 EAD for the three years. The after move this um, the new company. So, his wife work. Is it okay to work on the previous H4 EAD or he want to apply the new H4 and get the new H4 EAD to work? I think it's always best practice to go ahead and always file everything at the same time. So if husband and wife 
you know, are both in sync at, the, at all times. Um, and also, you know, it, what's important for H4 is that you have an H1B petition and the, and the beneficiary of that H1B petition is maintaining their status. Okay, so you have to have those requirements to, to legally be on H4 and maintain your status in that, in that category. So best practice is always file uh, H4, H4 EAD at the same time you're filing a change of employer. And that way we can always try and make sure that the dates are always in sync because there's a lot of times uh, where you, it's an extra headache where someone forgets, oh, but you know, the, my H1 doesn't expire until 2022, but I didn't realize my wife, ex her H1 ex or H4 expired November of 2020. You know, uh, there's always something like that. And, and it's always, you know, people find out after the fact. So best practice, go ahead file everything together. Um, and then that way you're also extend, it gives you the option to extend beyond, uh, file that extension early so you can get extra time uh, on that H4 EAD. Okay. Lucas, we got another question from Venkut. He applied the H1 extension and regular with the labor approval and uh, pending I-140 is is it possible attach I-140 approval when move to the H-1B extension and premium process? Uh, no. So what USCIS looks at is uh, at the time of filing. So what, what requirements or what um, uh, evidence did you have at the time of filing? Did you qualify for this benefit when you mailed the package or petition? So, you, you know, it would have to be a very, very odd circumstance where they would accept it at that time. So typically what we want to do is um, uh, have placeholders in place to where, you know, someone can, um, you know, there's always circumstances you could argue such as, you know, we're here in the pandemic right now or other things where uh, traditionally travel is not available. But as far as uh, I want 40 go and, 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 and approvals after the fact, uh, you typically would need to have that benefit at the time of filing. Okay. I think, uh, Venkat, you have a question. Yeah, you got uh, information from the Lucas. Um, Lucas, we got another question from Suresh. He, he, uh, he is on H1 and October 2020 applied for the ad adjustment of status. Now, he had an offer from the client to join them immediately. Can he join them use, using the H-1B transfer? Will there be any issue since he filed the I adjustment of status? No, there won't be any issues. And, um, you know, I'm sure his I-140 has already been approved for more than um, – six months so uh, the current employer probably won't be able to revoke the i-140 and um after six months of the adjustment of status pending you can you know request your new employer to sign a supplement j so you know at the end of the day um the most important thing you can do is protect your h1b status uh depending on what your priority date is you know if your priority date's like 2011 or 2012 it's still going to be many years before the GC is actually available under our current processing time. So you would, you know, barring any uh, miracle for, you know, the next two or three months, we get great news that, you know, all the backlogs taken care of, uh, it's still going to be a while. So you want to make sure you protect the H one B status and, um, you know, keep, keep all the options open to maybe pour it over the adjustment as, after six months. Okay. I think he is good as long as his previous employer maintained the I-140 until revoke. Well, he, the, you revoke. can't revoke. You can't revoke the I-140 uh, after six months. So even if the, yeah. he leaves, the employer can't. You know, I, Lucas, I hear maybe employer might be revoked the I-140 after six months, right? No. Uh, so under AC-21, one of the new uh, regs that came about it is that you, as far as like extending beyond your um, six year, 
you know, you can still use that I-140 to do so as long as it's been, you've had it more than six months. Now, as far as like using that to continue employment uh, and adjust your status, uh, you, you know, you'd probably want to have, uh, you would need to have some other ability to, to go ahead and do that for the future employment with the GC. Um, but yeah, it's, after six months, the, the policies, you, you know, employer can't go back. So the whole provision, not to go too in depth with what the policy is, the whole reasoning behind this is you want to have it easier for people who are here at H1 to switch employers. You don't want to be stuck uh, under an employer that you might not like or that, you know, the circumstances of your employment are, it, it could become an abusive situation or you might not be able to make as much money as if you worked somewhere else. So the provisions and the regs are set up to where it's easy for you to port over and change employers where you're not tied to that one specific, uh, employment. Okay. Uh, Lucas, we got another question from the Teja, the same already we discussed about this one. IFR is asking that how many years, how many years of, uh, uh one minute. Yeah, sorry for. So, how many years of H one H one B approval an employee can get if he working through third party? Just we discussed and uh, starting of show about the IFR. Maybe you can give this answer. Yeah. So everything will remain the same now, as far as the, that goes. We'll you'll still be able to get you know hopefully a maximum of three years uh, if your employer requests it. So. Uh, you know, it's, you know, we, we were stressed a little bit this past couple of months, especially with the wage increase and the potential limitations of the new um, regulations or the new rules under I, with the IFR. Uh, but, you know, luckily all that's been uh, suspended at this moment. And uh, that's something, you know, hopefully we can get back to business as usual, you know, here in the next day, uh, day or two. Okay. Lucas, we got uh, another question from Bhaskar Vallabha. So he wanted to clarify one thing regarding his application. Uh, his form is apply applied by, I think, current company in 2022, uh, 2012 in EB2 status. Current attorney is telling me that the Indian master 3 plus 2 is not equivalent to the US master and my application can be risked and cannot go back to downgraded nor apply I-485. Amen. So he's asking, are there any good option for me or? Well, I mean, you need to have a master's degree and, and depending on, and I rely on uh, the evaluators to tell me because I, I don't know offhand all the rules but i know like you know a bachelor's uh three-year bachelor's doesn't necessarily equal a bachelor's degree in here in the u.s certain master's degree might not either so um i'd have to be honest with you i'd have to review the education credentials with uh my evaluator to determine if that's the case but if that's what the attorney says then yes that if uscis approved your i-140 in error there's a great risk of you know, maybe having everything denied, um, uh, bringing that to the attention, trying to downgrade or do some other things. So, you know, that unfortunately that is something that, that might be, uh, a bad situation, you know, the, the way it's set up for you. So I would recommend, you know, maybe is discussing that in detail with the attorney, um, you know, going over any options that there might be, and, uh, you know, probably starting with your employer now to go ahead and start the process, if, if you haven't already, to file an, a, a different labor uh, and I-140 as a backup. So if, if that does come to light, you get a notice of intent to revoke the approved I-140, you, are, you have a, a backup plan in the works so you don't lose your status or you can't extend beyond, you know, the six years like you already are at. Okay. Here, just I want to discuss uh, about the EB2. Um, any H1 holder, if they want to apply in EB2, 
the general condition is uh, maybe he must do master in the United States or equivalent to the United States bachelor plus five years of experience so that they can apply an EB2, right? Correct. That is. So if you fall this condition, maybe if he fall this condition, maybe I'm not sure you give already alternative plan to check with attorney or maybe check the education evaluation. So uh, Lucas, the it means uh, Suresh is saying that still he is not clear uh, what will happen to adjustment of status since he did not pass threshold of 180 days pending, and I transferred my H1B. Uh, no, we again. No, we discussed the before uh, Suresh. He asked right. He applied the I-140 from the company A. He transferred to the company B. So at the same time, he applied the adjustment of status from the company A. Mm -hmm. So after apply the adjustment of status company A, he moved to the another company B. Let's say if the previous employer have the ability to withdraw the process within 180 days. So you. you you told already I, beyond the 180 days, the employer could not be uh, revoked the I-140. So what is what if still I-140 within the I-180 uh, 180 days period? So whenever you filed the adjustment of status, uh, that's going back with the I-140. That's for future employment. Um, as long as your adjustment of status is pending. For 180 days, anytime in the when the final action date becomes current, right? So your final action date is probably still years out under the current timelines. Uh, once your final action date, you know, becomes current, even if you're an employer C, D, E, F, or G, whatever it might be, as long as it's been pending for 180 days or the new employer can just file a supplement J. For, to say that this is and, and the job duties and responsibilities have to be similar it has to be a similar job you can port uh the adjustment to that new company okay, okay. it doesn't you, you don't have to actually be under h1 or anything like that you can port after the 180 days okay the Suresh, uh, still, if you're not clear, maybe you can send an email to the info at the red bgimmlaw.com. So, Lucas will give the valuable information to you. Lucas, we got another question about the H4 EAD. H4 EAD, he applied the H4 extension EAD. It's been more than five months, but haven't received the biometric appointment notification yet. So we, he reached out to USCS and their response is to wait. Anything else we could hear other than the raising service request with the USCS? So well, he said he's saying that he uh, they did not qualify for the expedite request with the job offer. So can we file here, expedite request or not? So here, here's the most important thing I want to convey. Um, I had one of the viewers or listeners to our show from uh, Telugu NRI Radio. He called this last week, and uh, he he was informing me that you know, hey, this happened where my H four for my spouse it was filed back in Jan, and we never received the receipt. We had to call multiple times, and finally in March, we received the receipt. So then we never received biometrics, so we kept calling and calling. And he said this last week that they received a denial notice in the mail because that they missed their biometrics appointment. So you have to you know, really stay on top of it and call as much as you can because you have to remember that there's you have your service center who's handling the H4, H4 EAD, here and they're just referring the appointment notice to each field office who's going to conduct the biometrics. So, you know, you're relying on people who might or might not be going back and making sure everyone, you know, is covered. So, uh, it's the best thing you can do is to call, speak to a level one officer, or maybe request a level two, or have an attorney 
if an attorney helped you file your case, have them help uh, see what they can do to get the biometrics done. Because, you know, there is a risk that if you never receive notice and you miss the biometrics, you know, obviously they're going to, USCIS will deny that application. Yeah. Hey, man, so I see a couple of questions about the bill S386. Hey, man, so a couple of websites are posted as a bill passed, but uh, you said is did not see any news from the uh, bill. What is a senator? Senator Bill. Uh, what is a bill? But he's asking that uh, <laughs> there is a little bit. I, I don't know. Just I'm hesitating to ask this question. Look like uh, Lucas is sad today. <laughs> that is called <laughs> Facebook. So, so I'm not sure the Lucas is busy the past couple of weeks. So the little bit uh, today is the evening. So I think you are pretty busy. That's why your face is swing uh, look like. It's a little bit sad. <laughs> no, it's not sad. I'm, it's just uh, been long days, you know, for the past probably three or four months. It's been very, very busy. Um, you know, a lot of these changes, I, I and I just want to say this, uh, any case I work on uh, or anything we do, I, I really put myself in the shoes of the people I help or that hire me to help them. And it's been very stressful. So if I appear... <laughs> tired it's because it i am tired because it's uh, you get so much stress and uh worry about what's going to happen you know how is someone who's you know waiting on their gc and now they can they have to file h1s every year or all this stuff it, it's it is it's been a very difficult time especially uh you know but today hopefully we have good news hopefully you know yesterday we had the court uh, suspending the ifr and hopefully you know if everything's true with the the uh the news about the senate bill i mean if they, i haven't heard officially yet but if if that passed that's great news and hopefully the president would sign that into law uh, and that because that would help with everyone out tremendously okay i think uh bill red i think you got the answer from the lucas yeah you got uh answer from lucas uh, Lucas, we we will take the last final question from the Srinivas Goody Party. He applied the he applied I four eighty five seven sixty five I three one three one on October twenty third under EB two category at the Texas Center. Till now, he didn't receive the receipt. How long it will take? Already we discussed. Just you can. Yeah. So under Supplement J. Uh, at the Texas Service Center, um, you should be receiving this week, uh, and then you know at the latest possibly next week. If uh, you might want to check and see if the checks cleared or your money orders cleared, and and if they did, you know receipts usually follow within three to four days after that. The one single, uh, if checks is ready, so you will get the you will get sooner the receipt receipt number, right? Yeah, and also on the back of the check, if you use your own personal check, usually they'll write uh, the case number for the, the adjustment uh, case on the back of the check. Okay. Yeah, we we fast to five minutes uh, over the five minutes over seven seven. I think uh, this week is a is a lot of good news for the H one holders. Yeah. The IFR maybe the bill. The country got a bill. If pass, very good news for everyone to get the green card. So yes, Lucas, we discussed a lot of things on H four EAD and uh, F four eighty five, and uh, I four. Apart from this, do you have any other information to share? Don't have anything else to share this week. But you know, like we say every week, I'll end on this note. Just make sure you follow and like. Uh, Telugu NRI Radio on Facebook and our office on Facebook, BGM Law. And uh, we try and post any updates as they happen uh, and, and share the news. So if you can, just follow and like our page and also share with your friends. And, uh, you know, we appreciate the, um, the questions and the input that, that all the listeners have because, uh, you know, they're we're, as again, like what Vinkat always said, the purpose of our shows is to serve the community. 
And uh, it takes members of the community to participate with us on the show to help other people out as well, because so many people might have the same questions. So uh, hopefully, you know, touch wood, we can keep getting good news. Lucas, closing the show, just uh, I will ask the one question from the Krantik Moore. Is master degree from for profit university is an issue for the EB green card? I think he know it is for the H1 master quota. At the time of graduation, university is uh, accredited. And what if losses later? Will the degree will be still considered? Is a advance. He want uh, some valid info input from you. I, I, you'd have to ask me one more time. Uh, let's say he pursued the master degree in United States. At the time, the college has the accreditation. Later, the accreditation it it got lost. So what is the situation to apply the, the green card process? So when you look at, so if you're talking about like a Northwest uh, Polytechnic University or Silicon Valley University, uh, if, you, if it was accredited when you received the degree, then that would account for accreditation. Now, um, for EB purposes for GC, um, you know, that, that should be sufficient uh, as a U.S. master's degree. Now, for cap exempt for, or ma I'm sorry, for master's cap uh, for the, you know, H-1B cap, that you'd have to have a, at the time you file, at the time you graduated, you'd have to have an accredited university. So uh, if there's anything, I, I think I, that's what's the question, but if there's anything more specific, you can definitely just uh, ping me off offline or send me an email and I'll try and help with any more specifics. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, last question, Santosh Kumar Kola. Can you discuss me more about the HR 1044? The Santosh already we discussed about this, um, the bill S386. Uh, maybe you can see this video later. As of now, we don't see any confirmed uh, information from the the official website, Congress website is got bill got uh, approved. Maybe in future next week, we will continue this show every week, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time. If any information on this bill, we will post or we will bring this information into the next show and we will discuss a very detailed detail and elaborated. We will try to provide the elaborated information to all immigration holders. And it's just it would be irresponsible unless we knew firsthand and verified the facts for us to speculate on that. So we just try and uh, we're going to hold off uh, with any information or news, e even if other people are tweeting this uh, until we get actual notification or from a valid source. So we're, we're not sharing information that might be inaccurate. That's the whole purpose yeah. about behind that. Yes, we are trying to share accurate information. So please wait for next week. If any information come across, we will definitely share to all the viewers. Yeah, I think uh, we fast 10, 10, 10 minutes, uh, Lucas. Uh, we can close now. Thank you for today. And thank you very much, uh, everyone who participated in this show and posted the questions. And, and uh, please, uh, maybe you can continue to Tune till going on radio, Facebook Live, and get more information on USA immigration immigration system. So we keep saying every week: if you have any specific topic you want to know, or if you have any specific scenario you already fall in, if you want to know more information about the immigration USA immigration system, just post your topic on Telguena Radio Facebook or Burgos and Garrison Facebook page, or you can send an email to the info either at bgimmlab.com or info.telguenarade at gmail.com. So we are ready to provide the accurate USA immigration information. So thank you. Thank you each and everyone to join today. And thank you, Lucas. You are participating every weekend and you are coming to the Telguenarade Facebook and helping to the Telugu community or Indian community on immigration system. We are very thankful to you. So then we, we can close today. Signing off from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you.